My name is James White. I'm from Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. My call sign was Angry Bird. Do you want to tell her why it's Angry Bird? Well, I got the name Angry Bird because one time I got back doing my chores and stuff, helping out a cat, and my tent door was, um, zipper was broken open and broken, so I froze that whole night, so I got mad, went up to the Mall of Nations. That's, that's what I called a donation place where people had donations and I found a blanket. And, um, that so-called blanket had a writing on it. I didn't notice it until after I put it up there that said Angry Bird on it. <laughs> so everybody started calling me Angry Bird ever since. And it stuck through, huh? Angry Bird. Angry Bird, now I know. Yeah, we gotta get you some stuff. <laughs> get the setup going. Oh, um, so you were... At Standing Rock pretty much from the beginning. Yeah, and the first part of April they called us horsebackers all to go up there and ride up there. Yeah. So that first day we all rode horseback all the way up to Cannonball from Standing Rock up there. And they asked me to um, play security for them with that, that next night, next couple of nights. And so we went up there from there and then we had a big, large overflow so we moved to Oshetti. You know, Shetty kind of was kind of like the overflow camp, and then it ended up being the big camp. Mm. So then how did you see camp change over time, or standing up change camp, camp? Camp changed, um, as camp changed over time, at first, uh, some, the, it was the uniting of all the tribes, people from all over was, was actually getting together as one, and as, as winter progressed, the camp, got along the more um the more the other side I called more and County and them got scared and stuff and started doing um bad things to arresting people and um Mason people they didn't understand that every action that they did against us um the outside world or people started getting up upset with it and fed up with it and started coming to camp and they, it's just that they wouldn't realize the more the more they harmed the people that were standing up for what they believed in, the more people would come to replace the ones that got hurt. Yeah. Did, did the feeling of camp change by the kind of February and then To me, um, the feeling of camp, well, to me the first time I went to camp was with the youth and the horses. Yeah. And then, then after that, then I lost a grand, grandson that died and so I buried him so I took a little while off then it was like I was uh, me personally I was empty inside I was missing something mm -hmm. so and so that just drove me back to camp but I was also got in so much turmoil with my kids family arguing and fighting like that that when I went to camp because I'm a true believer that everybody went to the when they went to that gate something in them changed and, and, and it's kind of hard for people to believe, but it, 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 it can happen. I've seen alcoholics that never went to programs and that were constantly drinking every day that went into them gates and stayed there. And didn't, didn't drink, didn't do nothing, but it, there was something that was healing people and helping people cope with life. And I found that out as a first-hand experience because when I went to the second time after I buried my grand, grandson, I was feeling so down. To me, that was my last straw was um, dealing with society and, and life in general. Cause I I got this thing called Parkinson's and um, uh, personality disorder that I lived with all my life. And all my life, I I stayed um, isolate. I isolated myself from people. But camp at the, me was my last straw. And then, but when I went to the gate, something in the chain, something made me more outspoken, made me, uh, gave me the strength to believe in myself and, and to be more outspoken and not to be, got, uh, more or less got tired of being pushed around and, 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 and say, hey, I believe what I'm standing for and I'm, no matter what it takes, I'm going to stand for that. So that's how we became um, a Kichi Tals, that we call ourselves. And that we, we chose and we took the oath amongst ourselves and the people pointed to us that 
we got to stand in line between the, the cops and the protesters and, and keep it and try to keep it the best we can in a spiritual manner and stuff, you know. And, and a lot of us guys have um, done that. But yeah, by us guys doing that and being out there in the front lines all the time, we got numbers by the, the police department, by the, the government and stuff, and agitators and rioters and stuff. So there's a few of us guys that are facing some pretty long time for, for just standing up for what we believe in. Yet they never did once come in, and we invited them hundreds of times to come into camp. We'll, we'll take you around, show you what camp's about. And, and to me, I think it has to be known that a camp with ten to eight to ten thousand people living in the camp, the the crime rate, the crime and the violence, what happened? You, there there wasn't that at the camp. There was a few bad incidents here and there, but as as another city that size, we were probably just a one percent crime rate compared to what cities had and everything had. And a lot of people don't. Can't, can't understand and can't believe that that group of this much different nationalities and religions can all work together. But camp had something special about it. Brown got the best in everybody. If he had expertise, it automatically boosted out and, and, and you showed it to the people in the camp. And the people understood that. You didn't have to be told what to do or whatever. And if you needed help, somebody at camp was always there to help you or assist you with your problem. And like I said, like a lot of us guys that call us guys boarding school prospect and showed us the meaning of there ain't nothing wrong with hugging somebody or, or, or telling somebody that you love them and hold them. It, there was, and, and a lot of us guys, we learned from that that it was, there was nothing wrong to show that. And, and to me, I think everybody that went to the camp got something positive really out of it. And, and I think what they got to keep passing it on, pass on, but it, it, it will be passed on to the younger generation, to their kids. Uh, hey, I learned this. This is how how easy it is to get along with a total stranger. It's just by giving them my ear and listening to them. So do you think, um, like, part of kind of that something that you were talking about at camp, like that healing thing and the thing, you know, that showed it was okay to feel emotions, it was part of that being heard and that people were like being heard in a lot of different See, it, it ain't just being um, heard. It, it, what we learned a lot of, for a lot of teacher individuals is that we, we we always knew we was no better than nobody else. But we also had that burden of it, and something pushing us to say, hey, you guys got to go out and do that, no matter what group or whatever organization decided to go out there and talk to the cops at that time. It was our, we took it amongst ourselves it was our obligation to be right there and stand with them to protect them. And then it got to the point where we, it was a habit where we constantly getting mates, constantly getting shot no matter what we did. But I always told them that we got to forgive them and pray for them or they did not they fear for what they do not understand or what they do not know. And we all got like, they gave us all these bad names, writers and stuff, but they got to understand that. We didn't, none of us ever went out to the tents, none of us ever had arms. We kept arms, we kept drugs, we kept alcohol and everything from coming into camp yeah. and stuff. But when they started sending people in and out to, to make um, um, havoc in camp, that we had to step up and, and find the people that were starting that. But it was also so religious and prayerful but to encamp on movements that nobody was told to go do this that. Everybody, were all volunteers and done it within their hearts that. But they knew it was right and everybody showed up. And, but like, my, like the horse, the horse, the horse nation kids, they were just a bunch of 22 year, 20, 20 kids on down to 16. But they loved riding horses. So it was a big, such a big camp, hard to get around. That cops and um, tigers, following them guys kept coming through the weeds and coming to camp and starting things on fire and stuff. That that's where the young horse horse nation kids and stuff decided, that, hey, I, I got a purpose. Hey, 
me and my horse you can do good, but constantly riding a big circle around camp all the time, and, which made it good, you know. But they also the peace bearded as aggressive medicine and stuff like that. But they didn't understand that. As a code of people, we were born and raised on. A lot of us were born and raised on horses. And that them are our best friends, you know. In our power, they were never there to conflict harm or anything. That was just part of our, our family that wanted to be at the camp with us. A lot of people are got to understand that camp was very very spiritual to a lot of people. And, and, and the way you went into that camp was the way something hit you. Because when you left camp, people would just turn around and come right back and, and stay there. So that tells me that there was something happening in that camp or something was meant to happen. Yeah, and being in a space where like, you go through your day every day in prayer. And, and it, it was just that people that never had a family, never was scared to call a family a family. A cat brought down a lot of people and, and showed them what a family was, told a stranger. Like in wintertime, we had 40 people in one big tent and, and stayed there, but we sat there, we ate together. There wasn't enough food for everybody. We all just shared, but people knew how to be gentle. There was just constantly sharing. There was nobody better than nobody else, but it was just taking care of one another. And you was feeling down, you had 10 people going over there talking to you and lifting your spirits back up. That's and, a really cool way of phrasing it, like, you know, showing people what it means to be. And, and, and that, that was, and that, to me, I think that was really unique to a lot of Native American people growing up was that, that bonding that we, we got at camp, that closeness, that tie, you know, that came from camp. And hopefully the younger generation can take that in and pass it on to, the, to their young ones when they get them and learn from that, that it's okay to show them kind of emotion instead of us guys living the old way where it was hard to show that emotion or we were as afraid of it. Do you feel like it's something that now not being in camp you can still? To, to me, not being in camp is uh, well, uh, is more like a punishment to me because of charges I got and this that and they're not letting me be be in camp and stuff. It's just their way of mentally hurting me because they knew how much I loved camp and, and, and being around with people. That, it's their way of putting a tie down on me and, and keeping me from expressing my opinion. But, uh, like I told them, they didn't think, I'm a taxpayer, I gotta pay taxes, I should be a right to speak my mind, I should be a, have that same right to travel down this highway, yeah. or a certain highway, or this freedom to go here and there. And, and, and I'm, I'm also an honorable veteran out of the service. Yeah. The honorable discharge and stuff, but yeah, this because they do not understand what that, what happened and stuff. They're, they're making eight of us guys into a lot of volunteers. Yeah. What is it that you would like them to understand? I like them to understand that they gotta look at both sides of the story. There's always going to be two sides to a story, and before you judge a people and, and people and people and stuff, learn both sides. Learn for what, they, you know, what they're mad about and, and what they're standing for, what they're trying to stand for. We, money, you can't buy, like these kids said, you can't buy everything with money. You can't buy love with money. You can't, you can buy fake love with money, but you can't, you can't buy the love that what camp showed so many thousands of people. That, that certain kind of people. You can't drink oil, you know. But my, my theory was is that where they drilled, they, they just have to pump that oil on her. They, they drilled over a top of one of the biggest aquifers in the world. And, and my theory is that they want that fresh, untouched water. You know, because everybody says water is going to be the next goal. Yeah. And if you got to control the second largest aquifer in the world, just like how powerful that's going to make them people. Mm -hmm. But then by, by bringing this oil and contaminant, everybody in the world I heard is standing up now. But it, you got to, because Mother Nature, you can't keep depleting her. 
she's just like us guys. You keep taking your blood out of you, you ain't gonna live. You keep mistreating your body, you ain't gonna live. And that's what every one of us individuals are doing, doing to the world. That we gotta show people that there's other alternative ways of being comfortable and making things comfortable. Like all the, everybody has kept. The, the, the comfort they wanted was just a little food, a little pet, stay at home and be loved and be heard, you know. But they all helped out. It, it, it didn't take that much to accomplish that. There so many different um, organizations of people. We all had the same thing in mind was to protect Mother Earth and, and, and let the world see what we're standing for, what we're fighting for. It wasn't just the oil going across the river we were standing by. Hey, Mother Earth is tired. Mother Earth needs needs our help now. That it's a, and they said seventh generation time. Okay, now come on, seventh generation. We gotta listen to our elders and start looking. But we also have to listen to Mother Earth and ask her what what do we gotta do to start uh, repairing her instead of keep damaging her because she she can't last too much longer. We keep taking everything out from underneath. What's gonna keep that pressure going? Something has to give. Do you want to talk some about the seven generations and the prophecies? See, seven gen me, I went there, I, I wasn't very much on, because I'm a boarding school prospect. Mm -hmm. I was denied learning Lakota language, learning the Indian culture ways, and everything. Because every time we tried to do that, we, we used to have nuns come and stop our hands with the rulers and pull our ears and make us kneel all day long. Things like that. So the uh, the native way of cultures was um, shut away from my generation of people living in. But then the young generation coming was brown to to help the world, and, and it's up to the elders to sit down and guide and show the young generation this is what Uchi Maka is ask, asking us to do for them is that we gotta listen and look what we destroy. And as the seventh generation, they gotta they gotta have that strength to say, hey, stand up for what is wrong, what what ain't right, and not just take it anymore like we took it for five hundred years to say, hey, we're tired now. We're we're, we're all equal, we ain't nobody greater than nobody else, so why can't we have this respect? And I think the seventh generation is gonna learn that. Education is very important to also pass the word on that. Hey, we got a voice no matter where we come from. It ain't just the color of our skin. That no matter what, what we gotta say is, is gonna help the earth. We should be heard, we should be listened to. And I think what happened down there in Standing Rock gave a lot of these youth the, the power and the, and the ability to know that it's okay to stand up and voice their concerns. There's in many ways a healing process from the boarding school. See, that, that, to me, that was one of the biggest healing processes I need, but I also was a guy that, when I went through that gate, I was the lowest I've ever been in my life. It was either that or he, meeting Harry Carey. You know, so I sat in my pickup for two days and just watched everything in can. I started working in donations and did that and passed my way on. And when I, when I incident that dog attack, and then I had to go up there and talk to him keep all those cops at me in my town I and mean, it's the wrong time to, if you guys go down there now, you just gonna make things a lot worse, you know. That was my first day of that incident was when I seen a dog attack person that had it, but I told him, you guys can investigate it, but it, right now it ain't, it ain't the time, you know, cause you go down there and show this and start pushing people around and just go, and they didn't understand that. They, there was always one side, one side. They always wanted to protect that stuff. All that time, they probably all had investment in what they were protecting for. So no matter what we did or said, was it gonna, it still don't make a difference to them. It's it's just that we gotta be able to let the world know that no matter what they're trying to throw out and what they're gonna do is that we still gotta stand strong and stand together as one. Because without unity, we're weak. Alone, we're pretty weak. They're gonna keep pushing us here and there, but if we keep the unity of everybody together in the same focus, we can accomplish a lot. Do you have a vision or ideas of what that could look like now? Right now, 
uh, I'm fighting with the, the lostness of what ha what's happening is that we've got camps all over the world. But me, I'm an old veteran person. That's, we started one one fight. We got to sit there and finish that one fight before we expand to the rest. But we can also still teach the young that this this is a way to be heard and to be speak. Because we went up there, even though we knew we had snipers pointing lasers at you 24-7, people shooting you. It didn't deter nobody. It, they just wanted to be heard and, and told that what you guys are doing is wrong, it's wrong. And the more we did that, the more they came back and with violence to, to, to hurt us because they thought by dispersing the crowd, was going to end it. But when something happened, it never did end, it just grew more camps. So, I mean, I know you're one of the eight. <laughs> You've helped here, all of that. Um, and we're at the front lines pretty much all the time. Well, that, that was the oath I took upon myself. It wasn't demanded of me to do it. It wasn't pointed. It was something in my heart that people asked. And, and since I was a veteran too, they asked me, Jimmy, you know how to, you've been in situations like this. Or, nobody, to me, I told them all, you just tell them, there was no guidebook. There was no right, wrong book, but we all knew the borderlines. And it was, I was at every action because I, I stood there under that oath as a Kichita to stand for the people, to protect the people, no matter what. And, and that's what I did loyally. And that, and I'm gonna stand by that, even though they're gonna take the rest of my life. Because I, as old as I am, I ain't got 30 more years. I can't spend 30 years in prison, but if I have to, so be it. You know, it's just uh, me. I think it's just a bunch of BS. But because I've never done nothing no wrong than the other 780 some people that got arrested, as I was just that. Uh, they couldn't catch me. I wasn't gonna let them catch me until I turned myself in. You know. So you didn't get arrested. No, I turned myself in. <laughs> What's it mean, like, what's it mean to turn yourself in? Like, what uh, you to, to, to turn yourself in is that we know they had these warrants for me, mm. to arrest me and stuff. So. Because they saw you and kept tracking you? Yeah, they, they, they numbered quite a few of us guys. They, they thought you was a Kichita or whatever. And we all had our armbands, colored armbands on the road. And we all got numbered because we wore these armbands. They thought we were the leaders or they. They, they are, these are the leaders, these are the guys that, so, these are the guys that went out of camp. And then, then uh, that was so funny, when they got me, they, all the, all the Boren County charges, I turned myself in. I said, okay, we know you're looking for me, and this, that, so we talked to some people and stuff, and I said, okay, we decided the best bet is go up to Bismarck, Mandan, and go to the jail, and, and, and turn myself in to the court, and let the court handle it. And what was funny about that is I was 10 feet away from, just 10 feet away from the jail, but yet they still had to come out and everything. <laughs> throw the handcuffs on me and everything and to walk me 10 feet into the jail. Mm -hmm. You know, but then they, then they bond me out. And then, then all of a sudden the federal government came after me. And then they arrested me at the Grand River. So you got arrested by the state of Dakota? And then, then the feds, the feds. Then, then, yeah, I got bonded out. Then, and after I brought it out, the federal government come and got me at the mm -hmm. casino and went out to eat breakfast. But, and then that's why I don't understand that. We were told that we had permission to be on Corland to do all of this stuff in Corland. And all of a sudden people were taking rules of them. We asked them, show us proof, show us paper, show us who give you this authorization. They would never give us a piece of paper. Even like when they tried to, when they harass us on the highway, we asked them, who's your badge number? What's your name? We wouldn't get that, but they're, they're just like, it was like the more the people they threw in jail, they thought it was going to deteriorate the movement. But the more, the more people got thrown in jail, the more bigger the movement got. And it just got to the point where they just come and just took, took a home, but they didn't, they just looked at the bad. They didn't look at what, how beautiful camp was when you had seven, eight thousand people living all together on a just simple, basic, basic ways. They, they, they didn't. Nobody wants to look at the 
the good side of how big it special we made something. They just the world just wants to look at all the the bad the, the bad stuff that happened. Yet they always got it on one side to base it. Okay, now we went up there. We we argued with cops or sometimes, and we stayed in their mind. Not arguing, it's just stating their belief and understanding why we're standing there. But yet, yeah, when another side can come and blast away and shoot you just point blank, or or just grab a can of mace on you, where is the law? Where is the justice? Yeah. You didn't do nothing wrong. The, there's a law saying that you can protest, but there's also a law saying that they, you should be be allowed to protest. But there also should be a law saying that just by speaking your mind, you shouldn't get a mouthful of mace or shot shot with rubber bullets and freezing temperature that is a, is as hard as rocks, you know. Yeah. What is what are they trying to say? Like, what are the charges? Me, mine is um using it's a charge that. Was it put on nobody since that, um, the Vietnam era? And they're using, using fire to, to keep uh, government function from happening. When they, they, they ran into a little thing where they wanted to take a North Camp, but the cops were raiding and busting up a North Camp. And they had 400 cops down there at this little other side. And then they thought they were just going to be able to come around it. Surround everybody, throw everybody in jail. But we we just stood there, stood in line, and, and told them that no, we we can't. As Kichi talk, we can't let you just come through and arrest everybody without a reason. But for us guys doing that and making them look like a fool, we're, we're gonna, I guess, they're gonna make us guys pay the ultimate price, you know. But, and it, and it was a charge that they never threw at nobody at all. Went back to town to Vietnam, and that was in the 70s. And now they're finally bringing it up again. But that's their way of deterring what the people believe in, the way to keep people from speaking up, I think. Even though you say you got the constitutional right to speak speak your mind, and if a certain word hurt somebody with money, how, how are you going to stop that? You know, they got the power. So that's where the seventh generation is vital for the people to learn the education, the, the, the rules, and honor. But the, how, how can we win the fight that they did not honor none of our treaties? None of our stuff that was governed to us a long time ago. If the United States government does not honor that, what rights do we have that Native Americans have? You know, and, and they're, they're mad because we finally got tired of out of 500 years, we finally decided to speak up. But, but it's just, uh, you know, uh, to me it's baffling because there are so many people that were alcoholics and, and on drugs and this that, but when they went to that gate of camp, that, that was the last thing in the mind. And that's what I love about camp so much. It, it, it cured, cured and healed a lot of people. How has it been for you now? Me? It's pretty tough. Knowing that what I did, I know it was not wrong and stuff, but then just uh, the confinement and uh, not being able to see your friends, your family that you made, and just had to keep them away from you was kind of tough. And, and to me, that's just a psychology way of trying to conquer people, divide and conquer, you know. But they don't understand that. The more they keep harassing us, the more and more people out there in the world are, getting to understand the mistreatment and misjustice that they do to us guys forever. But like I said, 30 years is a long time. It's a really long time. You do money can buy you damn near anything again. And nothing. Yeah. Because to me, the picking us on us eight guys, I don't think is 
is right, but it's it's a way for them to make a statement they're looking for of guinea pigs or somebody to make the statement on and use it as a statement. I mean, they might also, like you could win the case, right? I think uh, they got nothing on me. They've done nothing wrong. So I think hopefully my lawyers and everything are good enough that I'm going to walk out of there scot free. But it's also this torment of what you got to go through is, is for a guy with um, personality problems all your life. This, this harassment that is given to you here and there it is pretty hard to deal with on a day-to-day basis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that not knowing what's going on. Yeah, and, and it's just that, it's just like the trick they, they did, like when they used water against us. You know, that was just kind of like the inside slap to your face. That's the same thing that I did to us, because, uh, no, you can't talk to this, you can't talk to here, you can't talk to here, but me. I'm tired now. Hey, I may not get a chance to talk to in. You know, they might have me get a little box where I can't talk to nobody. You know, that's that's what they want. But, you know, you gotta just keep believing what you stood up for and understand and keep praying for what you stood up for was right. What you did, hopefully they come to the senses and say, hey, enough's enough. Let's let's start taking this stuff over with it. Because they already said it's a new history book thing, you know, or it's a new history book. To me, we've been pushed and pushed around for over 500 years now, and, and, and anybody's bound to get tired of it now. It's just that more people from different cultures are starting to understand the torment in which we all been living all our lives, and, and are, are starting to understand that this ain't right. So a few questions that I need to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? I'd be like. I remember when I was at the front lines, of things that people would say in camp in general, and they'd be like, "Pray and hold the line, and the ancestors will fight the battle above and set it straight." Um, and now you're in also the situation where you're facing no possible jail for the rest of your life and all of that. Is that something that you believe or feel, or kind of what's the process of holding also on to those beliefs and feelings when it no, be, is like this? When I was always at the front line, I, I honestly believe I had a crazy horse standing with me because every time I went there, before I went there, I, I seen a picture of it mm. pop in my head. So I think he was my protector at camp on the front lines. And then me facing all this jail time, I got to get back to the belief of keep, keep telling myself what I did wasn't wrong. It wasn't. And, and, and I got to keep telling myself that. And hopefully that sooner or later, the, these government people are going to start listening to that. What everybody does is just to tell them to open up their eyes and look what we're doing to Mother Earth. You did such a good thing. You know, and it's just something like that, that it's torment, and to me, being in the military and stuff, that's just their way of tormenting us, keep trying to keep us tormented. But, but we also got to believe that what we all stood up for is all came from our heart. Because they could, they could say we had guns and everything every time, but everybody had caught me, that was just all a bunch of lies. Because you got to look at the crime statistics in camp. Yeah. It wasn't that much compared to 10,000 people and no law enforcement or whatever there. There was no hardly any crimes there. Just yeah. little penny thing is just most of this little squabbles. And most that of was, the stuff that happened was because feds or... You know, it infiltrated in the yeah. doing, doing things, you know. And, and, and a lot of them that they are confessing to it. But my, my concern is that I think, honestly, we really got to get everybody that we're at camp, especially the young ones, we got to have ways of, and if nothing else comes good of it, we got to have people that, to go talk to the young seventh generation, the kids, the young young teenagers, the, the 20 year olds that there, were there at camp to help some of this post-traumatic stress things that everybody are going to, otherwise it's, geez, and, and nobody can get that fixed to these kids. 
this is going to torment them in a long time. My, 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 my cure was to be able to talk to people, to, to, to vent it out, to let it out. But if people don't go and start confronting the young generation, we know what you did. And like these arteries are great for them because the young ones can understand and come, can come to a conclusion of, okay, what I did wasn't wrong. I shouldn't I should be hard on myself. I should be proud of what I stood for, you know. We gotta, we gotta, as elder people and other people, we gotta keep showing and finding ways to show that to the young ones for, for them speaking up for, for what they did and started that. It wasn't wrong, but it was kind of like a great thing that, that to, to break that silence. We gotta keep telling them what they did was okay. And like me, I gotta keep coming to the conclusion that what I did was okay. But if the other side wants to pull me away for like, what can I do about it? You know, I ain't got the money to fight them. You know, but I sure now ain't gonna go sit there and uh, say say I'm guilty to something I believe I ain't guilty of. So they're gonna have to fight me all the way through. You know, but what is, what is scary about it is. I still got to go to court in a, in a town where everybody's totally against that. Yeah. And so for me, finding a, 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 a jury of 12 people that ain't biased or yeah. whatever is going to be pretty pretty tough, you know. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully other people in the outside world will see how misjustice is unfair that we've been treated all these, all these years. But, you got in if you live close to Indian reservation, you got eighty percent of your young Indian people that went to prison for something stupid. Yeah. You know? And then they think we're all violent people. You know? It wasn't I don't see one person you can't violent even against their own fellow person. Unless the ones that were in there doing were paid paid to do it, you know. And, and that's what I, I love Capital so much because it taught us to show love. It taught us just to treat everybody as an equal, nobody better than nobody else. It's just that we're all the same people. No matter what color you are, because we all bleed red. And the people got to understand that. To, and, and to adapt, we got to be able to listen to the young ones and let the young ones adapt it. Some of their religions or their beliefs inward. Down the circles to keep the circle going. Why do you think it's important to listen to the young ones? Because the young ones are, is our upcoming future, and if they don't, we don't speak to them and tell them that they got the right to speak and be heard. They ain't gonna speak up. They they won't speak up, and they're gonna just keep getting pushed further and further back in the corners. But we're running out of places to go, and they're coming out to our Indian land. And wanted to drill our oil or seize our land and take it because we got all they that they put us on the poorest land because you can't farm it or you can't really work it. But then yet we got all that mineral underneath the ground that they want now. You know, and we gotta start telling our young ones it's okay to speak up, to tell them that hey we're tired of this. That we 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 should be treated the same. You know, hopefully a lot of young ones are going to take it and, and gain that knowledge and knowledge of working together as unity as one, you can get a lot accomplished. You know, and, and that's just like that, that so-called Turtle Island, you know, call for help, the whole camp came because they, they weren't asked, they weren't told to, they came because they got tired, they were fed up with what they were doing. You know? And, and to me, that was amazing how many, so many people from different places, and, and they all sat there. They, knew, they all knew the water was cold, but they said, no, this is enough, no, we're going to make a point. And to me, that was a, a very outstanding move, move for everybody just to do, to let them know that we're fed up now. This is, we're going to be heard. This is a point that we want to hear, you know. And it wasn't about the oil that. You know, it was about the 14 grades that they were up there. Yeah, everybody was mad about the beat on it. That was nowhere in the pipeline, nowhere near it. It was just for their way to spy on everybody and peek at everybody, but they also didn't know that 
they knew they were standing on a bunch of um, graves up there. The, the elders got tired and asked, asked us guys to go up there and tell them to leave us. Get off us so we can pray and let them rest in peace. Because, you know, if we done that to theirs, we'd all, the people that went on the grave would all be in jail. But we, we, wouldn't stu we wouldn't stoop that low to go and designate some of the graves. But you spent your time on earth. Then you put it in the ground, we gotta respect that. That's part of your life, you know, we gotta cherish that. We can't just keep digging up everybody's graves here and there to put the second tier of burying somebody if we don't respect it. You know, it's it's just that the world would be a better place if everybody just treats everybody as an eco. And you can get along better, you know. But the, the camp showed a lot of Native Americans what it is to truly show the feeling of love and not being afraid to express your feelings. And as I showed a lot of people in the world, that everybody from other other colors, other races, whatever, can all get along together without all this turmoil and without guns and things. Do you have other things that you would like to add? I just hope that people, the outside people that are so against us will come to an understanding that it ain't just about what we did, it's, just, it's about what Mother Earth is asking us that. We got to start changing, changing the way we, we're living and, and give, give the people the chance to show them that you can live self-sustainable if you give it the chance. Well, but then, uh, everybody needs a chance. You gotta give everybody a belief and let people live their dreams. Give them that goal. You can't keep just pushing them aside. And, and that my, that's my faith for the younger generation. Is don't be afraid to speak up now because we're sorry. Us old guys, we, we sat back and been quiet for so long. Is that we should have braved up and worried up a long time ago and say, hey, no, we're tired. We're going to speak up. What is ours is ours. We don't want the whole United States. We just want what's given to us ours back, you know. What's the balance between listening to and respecting your elders and then also as a young person? Your elders are your teachers. They're showing your ways because they live their lives. They show you the understanding, the wisdom. But also they've got enough knowledge to accept what is thrown at them and to run it through the mind if it's a good safety or what. But we also got to open our minds up and not say, hey, let's stay this one way. But we got to be able to open our minds up to allow the new one so we can keep growing. Because if we don't listen to the young generation, how are they going to keep stand, how would they, they stand up if we don't want to give them the time? And I think a lot of people learn that. Well, the guts and the the strength that the young ones showed us gave, gave a lot of the old people new life, new belief. It ain't all in vain, it's got to keep going. You know, and then, like it's comical, the way they were singing them songs or whatever. That's, that's our humor. If, if we didn't tease you, that means we didn't love you or we didn't care about you enough to give you that teasing, that was just the way we was growing up, was teasing one another or whatever to get them that smile. That, that's our, that was our way of showing that we care about you. But now, Cap showed us just walk up to him and hug him and say, hey, we're glad you're here, or we're glad you're there. And that showed a lot of people. And to me, I think that's the most educated and positive thing that I love about that old Cap is that we just, just didn't show me, it showed a lot of other people that. We're fighting the same thing I'm fighting that was okay to do that. <laughs>